chapter twelve of abraham lincoln a history volume ten this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org abraham lincoln a history volume ten by john hay and john george nicolay chapter twelve johnston surrender sherman soon wearied of the civil administration of savannah and of the adjacent region of georgia which had suddenly grown loyal he received in january a visit from the secretary of war in which many matters pertaining to the care of captured property and the treatment of reclaimed territory were discussed and settled but the business which lay nearest to sherman's heart and occupied most of his time was the preparation for his march northward of five hundred miles which was to bring him in upon grant's left wing to finish the war either on the banks of the roanoke or the james he pushed forward with his accustomed untiring zeal the work required to put his magnificent army in position to traverse the wide pine barrens the spreading swamps and the deep rivers that lay between him and his goal and so rapid was his progress that he would have found himself ready to start by the middle of january had it not been for the torrents of rain which fell during that month swelling the savannah river out of its bed and flooding the rice-fields on its shore for miles around he made a lodgment meanwhile at pocotarligo where the railroad to charleston crosses the combahee meeting so little resistance as to convince him that there was a sensible diminution of the energy of the confederates the weather cleared away bright and cold at the end of january and with the opening days of february the great march to the north was begun howard commanded the right wing consisting of the fifteenth and seventeenth army corps under logan and blair slocum the left wing the fourteenth corps under jeff c davis and the twentieth under a s williams the cavalry was led by kilpatrick a grand total of sixty thousand men added to this grant had promised him important reinforcements on the way he had abundant stores with what he could collect on the march of food and forage and ammunition enough for a great battle fortunately this last was never to be used the whole campaign in fact is mainly interesting to the military student as one of the most remarkable marches which history records it amazed the confederate commanders that sherman should have thought of advancing before the waters subsided there is no account of another such march from savannah to goldsboro is a distance of four hundred and twenty-five miles the country is for the most part low and at that season wet intersected by innumerable rivers and streams bordered by swamps traversed by roads hardly deserving the name mere quaking causeways in a sea of mud the advance guard frequently waded through water waist deep the country was almost as destitute of maps as the region of the congo every step forward was made gropingly at the crossing of the Salkahatchee by logan's corps it was found the stream had fifteen channels all of which had to be bridged the roads were impassable to artillery or train wagons until corduroyed under the heavy weight the logs gradually sank till another layer was necessary and this toilsome process had to be repeated indefinitely bridging chaos for hundreds of miles as general cox calls it there are few instances of equal energy and success in the conquest of physical conditions general sherman himself when it was all over compared the march northward with the march to the sea in relative importance as ten to one he had little except the forces of nature to fight with on the way by skilfully feigning to right and left he produced the impression that both charleston and augusta were threatened while he marched almost unopposed to columbia charleston being thus termed fell like a ripe fruit into the hands of dahlgren and gilmore on the eighteenth of february general hardy hurrying northward to chira on the great p d there was nothing like organized resistance at the beginning of the march even at points where it was expected 
when howard drew near the railroad between charleston and augusta he paused to deploy his leading division to be ready for battle while thus engaged a man came galloping down the road whom he recognized as one of his own foragers on a white horse with a rope bridle shouting hurry up general we've got the railroads a vital line of communication had been captured by a squad of bummers while the generals were preparing for a serious battle beauregard and wade hampton who were both in columbia had neither the means nor the disposition to make any effectual resistance general sherman entered the place on the seventeenth of february that night a great part of the town was destroyed by fire ignited sherman says by the burning cotton bales which had been set on fire by the retreating confederates in spite of all that could be done to check the conflagration it raged all night and left the capital of south carolina a heap of ashes sherman did everything in his power to relieve the houseless and destitute people he provided shelter for many gave five hundred beef cattle to the mayor and took measures to maintain public order after the army should be gone he destroyed the railroad for many miles and after a halt of two days resumed his march to the north after leaving columbia the country was less difficult and the rate of progress more rapid with no more delay than was necessary to destroy the railroads of the state the army pushed on towards the great p d this was a most important stage in the journey sherman felt if he crossed that river prosperously there lay no serious obstacle before him south of the cape fear and that river he expected to find in the possession of the national forces hardy after evacuating charleston had established himself in formidable works at chara but sherman flanked him out of them with his left wing and the right wing under howard crossed the pd and took the town on the third of march with twenty-eight pieces of artillery three thousand small arms and a great quantity of stores hardy and hampton retreated rapidly to fayetteville on the cape fear sherman following with equal celerity entered that place on the eleventh and established communications with the splendid force which schofield had brought from tennessee to the north carolina coast at fayetteville sherman destroyed the arsenal with all its valuable machinery if he could have foreseen the speedy close of the war this would not have been done there was now apparently no obstruction to the concentration of all his forces at goldsboro a place of the utmost value and importance being the point where the railroads running from the coast to the tennessee mountains and from wilmington to richmond crossed each other to hold which was sooner or later to strangle the confederate army in virginia but sherman was not to accomplish this final stage of his last great march without meeting a more determined resistance than he had as yet encountered beauregard who was enfeebled by long illness in body and mind had been superseded on the twenty third of february by general joseph e johnston who had received from lee the comprehensive order to concentrate all available forces and drive back sherman he immediately assumed command not flattering himself that he could defeat his formidable adversary but determined to do everything in his power to keep his army together in such condition that when the end came he might obtain fair terms of peace his army though wholly inadequate to the task of driving back sherman was by no means contemptible it is almost impossible to determine with any accuracy the numbers of the confederates at this stage of the war jefferson davis general johnston and general beauregard differ widely but a careful examination of all their statements and reports indicates that johnston could command with hardee's troops and the remnants of what thomas had left on foot of hood's army something like thirty thousand men he had to give bragg a portion of this force to oppose the march of schofield from the coast and with the rest he did what he could to delay sherman's inevitable progress with the exception of occasional cavalry skirmishes of little importance in one of which on the tenth of march hampton surprised and came near capturing kilpatrick the two armies came into collision only twice at avery borough on the sixteenth of march slocum with the left wing found hardy entrenched between the cape fear and a neighboring swamp sherman riding with that wing 
personally directed the brief engagement which ensued hardy was driven from his position and retired in the night and sherman pursued his march going to the right to join howard general johnston having by this time come to the conclusion that sherman was moving upon goldsboro concentrated nearly all his force about twenty thousand men at bentonville where on the nineteenth a severe fight took place between him and slocum commanding the left wing of sherman's army slocum finding the enemy too strong in numbers and position to be swept aside reported the condition of things to sherman who instantly started for the scene of action bringing up his right wing to slocum's support he found johnston established on the south side of mill creek very much as hood had found schofield at franklin johnston's position was even stronger his whole left being covered by a brook running through a swamp which seemed at first sight impassable sherman found among his prisoners representatives of so many brigades and divisions the phantom relics of hood's army that he overestimated the numbers opposed to him and therefore instead of at once overpowering johnston's force he proceeded with unusual caution on the afternoon of the twenty first general joseph a mower who held the extreme right of the national line made his way with great boldness and skill through the difficult swamp in his front and with two brigades pushed close to the bridges in johnston's rear if he had been supported he could have cut off johnston's retreat but sherman did not think it wise to risk a general engagement at that moment and ordered mower to withdraw which he did under the fire of the forces which johnston hurriedly threw against him the day's work was the last fight of the two great armies it elated the confederates beyond what it was worth they cannot be made to believe to this day that mower withdrew under orders sherman in his memoirs blames himself for not having followed up mower's success but the result justified his wise forbearance the war ended just as soon as it would have done if he had plunged among the swampy thickets at bentonville and sacrificed thousands of lives in a murderous grapple with johnston's veterans johnston made good his retreat in the night and sherman hurried on to goldsboro he rode into the place at the head of his troops on the twenty third finding that schofield had arrived there the day before the grand junction was accomplished the great army of the west was once more united the heroes of franklin and nashville shook hands with those who had marched to the sea sherman with his ninety thousand veterans trained to marching and fighting under conditions before unknown to the world was henceforth not only invincible but irresistible the days of the confederacy were numbered when he rode into goldsboro there was nothing left to do but to gather up the fragments of the revolt from every quarter the triumphant legions of the union were moving to consummate victory at the same moment that the armies of sherman and schofield came together at goldsboro two splendidly equipped cavalry expeditions were moving east and south from thomas's department the one under j h wilson to the pacification of alabama the other under stoneman to destroy lee's last avenue of supply or escape in the mountainous region where the boundaries of virginia north carolina and tennessee come together thomas had already in the month of december sent stoneman with two brigades to sweep east tennessee clear of the enemy he then crossed over into virginia and descending the valley of the holston to saltville destroyed the extensive and valuable salt works at that place the iron manufactories at marion and the lead works of with county he drove breckinridge out of the country and into the secretaryship of war at richmond burnt bridges twisted rails and captured some guns and prisoners on the twenty second of march he started out again this time moving towards lynchburg to head off the expected retreat of lee he did not pursue his old track up the holston as there was a small confederate force along that river which might have delayed him but crossed the blue ridge by way of the watauga to the yadkin and thence turning sharply to the north reached withville without opposition here he destroyed a large depot of confederate supplies and rendered useless 
by the seventh of april some ninety miles of railroad to the west of lynchburg so that if lee had broken through sheridan's lines at appomattox he would have met capture or famine immediately beyond on the ninth not knowing what weighty transactions were making the day forever memorable stoneman pushed southward and on the twelfth defeated pemberton and gardner and captured salisbury north carolina with its enormous wealth of stores accumulated with the utmost toil and pain in the last throes of the confederacy as a reserve stock for lee's army he destroyed everything in accordance with his orders not aware of the situation which made this havoc unnecessary and went back to tennessee the ride of wilson's troopers into alabama was one of the most important and fruitful expeditions of the war and justified by its celerity its boldness and good judgment the high encomium with which grant sent wilson to thomas after the battle of nashville and the dispersion of hood's army wilson had passed the rest of the winter in drilling and equipping his force and he swung loose from the tennessee river on the twenty third of march with three fine divisions commanded by generals eli long emory upton and edward mccook a train of two hundred and fifty wagons especially adapted for rapid travelling and packed with small rations and ammunition he relied on the country for bread and meat arriving at jasper he received information of the movements of forrest who commanded the confederate forces in his front which determined him to sacrifice everything to swift marching he left his trains behind well guarded made his men fill their haversacks with food and pushed on with such relentless energy that the scattered detachments of force could make no stand nor accomplish any effective concentration against him he sent flying columns to the right and left to destroy public property and stores but led his main column so impetuously that even the energetic and rough-riding forest could nowhere turn long enough to fight at hillsborough wilson reached a bridge so hot on the heels of the enemy that they could not destroy it coming to montvallo on the thirty first he wrought great destruction of iron furnaces collieries in the few hours he could spare but still pushed forward driving the enemy who though constantly increased by additional detachments could not gain time enough to make an effectual resistance at last forrest having collected all his available force in a strong position at plantersville six miles north of selma gave battle for that important railroad and manufacturing centre and met with a total defeat his lines being broken and his forces driven helter-skelter into selma wilson wasted not an instant after his victory although it was won on a day in which he marched twenty-four miles at dawn on april two he closed in upon selma and spent the day establishing his lines and searching the works richard taylor had fled in the morning to demopolis intending to bring back a relieving force but it was not wilson's habit to allow time for this he assaulted the works late in the evening and carried them at every point after a hot but brief conflict forrest escaped in the confusion and joined a portion of his command which had been cut off at marion by wilson's swift marching if the confederacy had not been already wounded to death the loss of selma would have been almost irreparable their greatest manufacturing arsenal was there and enormous stores of every kind wilson after destroying everything which could be of advantage to the enemy moved east on macon georgia and it was reserved for a detachment of his troops to capture the fugitive confederate president on his flight towards the florida coast sherman returned to goldsboro from his journey to city point on the thirtieth of march he was able to come by rail from new Bern. so rapidly had the skill of his engineers repaired the ruined road he set himself at once to the reorganization of his army and the replenishment of his stores so as to be able to move by the tenth of april the day agreed upon with grant the day after the deluge as it turned out he still thought there was a hard campaign with desperate fighting before him he superseded williams by mower in command of the twentieth corps because he considered the latter superior in tactical fighting qualities 
with that vast army greater than grant's under him supplied now by rail from moorhead and wilmington with all that the nation's imperial wealth could afford with the broken rebellion tottering to its fall in every southern state he was still as careful and as laborious in every particular of his preparation for his next march as if he were beginning a great war with an equal adversary he had not comprehended the full measure of his own success so late as the twenty fourth of march he wrote to grant i feel certain from the character of the fighting that we have got johnston's army afraid of us as if that were not natural under the circumstances grant himself up to the last remained singularly modest and reserved in his expectations his mind was full of care on sherman's account during all his triumphal march northward when i hear that you and schofield are together he wrote with your back upon the coast i shall feel that you are entirely safe against anything the enemy can do safe with those armies the phrase does not sin by exaggeration even on the sixth of april when the news of the fall of richmond and the flight of lee and the confederate government towards danville reached goldsboro sherman was still unable to understand the full extent of the national triumph of course he says i inferred that general lee would succeed in making junction with general johnston with at least a fraction of his army somewhere to my front he admired and respected grant so far as a man might short of idolatry yet the long habit of respect for lee led him to think the confederates would somehow get away he had on the day before drawn up elaborate and detailed orders for the march which was to begin in earnest on the twelfth and be directed to warrenton near the roanoke river he now changed his plan and prepared to move straight upon johnston's army which was at smithville halfway to raleigh he started promptly on the morning of the tenth the next day he reached smithfield finding it abandoned johnston having retired to raleigh burning his bridges while these were repairing sherman received the great news from appomattox he issued a brief and sententious order in his happiest vein glory to god and our country he said and all honor to our comrades in arms towards whom we are marching a little more labor a little more toil on our part the great race is won and our government stands regenerated after four long years of war a young staff officer galloped along the lines of the army of the ohio shouting the glorious news to the troops who were lying at ease in the warm spring sunshine on either side of the road his words were received with wild rejoicing they meant peace an end of marching and battle an end of hatred and strife a return to home and its loves and duties the troops broke into strange antics eminent officers of the highest rank and dignity turned somersaults on the grass one soldier as he caught the shouted tidings yelled back at the galloping mercury you are the man we have been looking for these three years even the inhabitants of the country shared in the general joy the worn and weary women caught up their ragged children and cried now father will come home sherman definitely relieved from the apprehension of a junction of the confederate armies had now no fear except of a flight and dispersal of johnson's force into guerrilla bands if they ran away he felt he could not catch them the country was too open for that they could scatter and meet again at a pointed rendezvous and continue a partisan warfare indefinitely he could not be expected to know that this resolute enemy who had met him on a hundred fields with such undaunted valor was sick to the heart of war and longing for peace the desire for more fighting survived only in a group of fugitive politicians flying from a danger which did not exist through the pine forests and woodlands of the carolinas entering raleigh on the morning of the thirteenth sherman turned his heads of column in the direction of salisbury and charlotte hoping to cut off this southward march of johnston he made no great haste for thinking johnston superior to him in cavalry he wanted sheridan to arrive before pushing the confederates to extremities he tried to persuade the civil authorities at raleigh to remain at their posts but the governor zebulon b vance had fled fearing arrest and imprisonment the next day kilpatrick who was far in front with the cavalry reported that a flag of truce had arrived with a communication from general johnston it reached sherman in raleigh it was dated the thirteenth of april and was in these words the results of the recent campaign in virginia have changed the relative military condition of the belligerents 
i am therefore induced to address you in this form the inquiry whether in order to stop the further effusion of blood and devastation of property you are willing to make a temporary suspension of active operations and to communicate to lieutenant-general grant commanding the armies of the united states the request that he will take like action in regard to other armies the object being to permit the civil authorities to enter into the needful arrangements to terminate the existing war this proposition which was simply for an armistice to enable the national and the confederate governments to negotiate on equal terms had been dictated by jefferson davis who had then reached greensboro on his flight southward written down by s r mallory and merely signed and sent by general johnston it was inadmissible even offensive in its terms but general sherman anxious for peace and incapable of discourtesy to a brave enemy took no notice of its language and answered at once in terms so unreserved and so cordial that they probably encouraged the confederates to ask for better conditions of surrender than they had expected to receive i am fully empowered he said to arrange with you any terms for the suspension of further hostilities between the armies commanded by you and those commanded by myself and will be willing to confer with you to that end he gave notice that he would limit his advance to certain points and asked johnston to stay in his present position pending negotiations he suggested the appomattox conditions as a basis of action and promised to obtain from grant and stoneman a suspension of hostilities johnston who after sending his letter had marched with his army towards greensboro received sherman's reply on the sixteenth when he was within a few miles of that place he hurried to greensboro to submit the letter to jefferson davis who was the real principal so far in the negotiation but found that he had started for charlotte and johnston therefore arranged a meeting for noon the next day the seventeenth at the house of a mr bennett on the raleigh road the two great antagonists who had dealt each other so many sturdy blows during two years at last met not without emotion which was heightened by sherman's communicating to johnston the news he had that morning received of the murder of mr lincoln the confederate general expressed his unfeigned sorrow at this calamity which smote the south he said as deeply as the north and in this mood of sympathy the discussion began sherman said frankly that he could not recognize the confederate civil authority as having any existence and could neither receive nor transmit to washington any proposition coming from them he expressed his ardent desire for an end to devastation and offered johnston the same terms offered by grant to lee johnston replied that he would not be justified in such a capitulation but suggested that they might arrange the terms of a permanent peace the suggestion pleased general sherman the prospect of ending the war without the shedding of another drop of blood was so tempting to him that he did not sufficiently consider the limits of his authority in the matter and besides his heart was melted at the sight of his gallant adversary so completely at his mercy he afterwards said in his report of the transaction to push an army whose commander had so frankly and honestly confessed his inability to cope with me were cowardly and unworthy of the brave men i led questions arising as to a general amnesty and as to the power of johnston to bring about the surrender of the confederate forces in texas consumed the afternoon and the generals parted to meet the next day general sherman going back to raleigh found all his general officers eagerly in favor of the negotiations he had begun and thus confirmed in his own prepossessions he renewed the discussion at noon on the eighteenth here he committed a grave error in assenting to johnston's proposition to introduce john c breckinridge into the discussion not as secretary of war they agreed but as an officer of the general staff regan the confederate postmaster-general who was somewhere in the background sent in a written scheme of capitulation which johnson read as a basis of agreement sherman at last after listening to a speech by breckinridge seized a pen and wrote with an ease and rapidity which surprised johnston the following memorandum of agreement one the contending armies now in the field to maintain the status quo until notice is given by the commanding general of any one to its opponent and reasonable time say forty-eight hours allowed two the confederate armies now in existence to be disbanded and conducted to their several state capitals there to deposit their arms and public property in the state arsenal 
and each officer and man to execute and file an agreement to cease from acts of war and to abide the action of the state and federal authority the number of arms and munitions of war to be reported to the chief of ordnance at washington city subject to the future action of the congress of the united states and in the meantime to be used solely to maintain peace and order within the borders of the states respectively three the recognition by the executive of the united states of the several state governments on their officers and legislatures taking the oaths prescribed by the constitution of the united states and where conflicting state governments have resulted from the war the legitimacy of all shall be submitted to the supreme court of the united states for the re-establishment of all the federal courts in the several states with powers as defined by the constitution of the united states and of the states respectively five the people and inhabitants of all the states to be guaranteed so far as the executive can their political rights and franchises as well as their rights of person and property as defined by the constitution of the united states and of the states respectively six the executive authority of the government of the united states not to disturb any of the people by reason of the late war so long as they live in peace and quiet abstain from acts of armed hostility and obey the laws in existence at the place of their residence seven in general terms the war to cease a general amnesty so far as the executive of the united states can command on condition of the disbandment of the confederate armies the distribution of the arms and the resumption of peaceful pursuits by the officers and men hitherto composing said armies not being fully empowered by our respective principles to fulfil these terms we individually and officially pledge ourselves to promptly obtain the necessary authority and to carry out the above programme this agreement was signed by the two generals thus the wisdom of lincoln's peremptory order to grant of the third of march was completely vindicated no general in the field could be trusted to make terms of peace involving the future relations of the states with the national government on the confederate side in this affair the military commander had completely effaced himself while general sherman who had begun most properly with the offer of grant's terms at appomattox had in the two days negotiations set on foot by jefferson davis and carried on by regan and breckinridge ended by making a treaty of peace with the confederate states but two things must always be said in his defense neither the government nor general grant had ever communicated to him the president's instructions of the third of march forbidding grant to decide discuss or to confer upon any political question a neglect for which both were to blame secondly grant in overstepping his powers by granting pardon and amnesty to all the officers of lee's army had naturally created in sherman's mind the impression that he might with equal propriety venture upon the exercise of similar powers he says also in justification of his action that mr stanton when at savannah had spoken of the terrible financial strain of the war and had made him believe that the termination of this waste was an object so desirable that great sacrifices should be made to obtain it but when all possible explanations have been made the fact remains that general sherman though perfectly loyal and subordinate to the civil authorities so far as obedience to orders was concerned ready to lay down his life at any moment at their command had the low opinion of civilians which is so common to soldiers and thought the generals in the field more competent to make peace or war than the politicians in washington a year before he had said to grant even in the seceded states your word now would go further than a president's proclamation or an act of congress and now three days after this agreement had been dispatched to washington for approval he returned to the political aspect of the matter in a letter to johnston referring to the question of slavery and saying although strictly speaking this is no subject of a military convention yet i am honestly convinced that our simple declaration of a result will be accepted as good law everywhere of course i have not a single word from washington on this or any other point of our agreement but i know the effect of such a step by us will be universally accepted on the same day these confident words were written the text of the agreement arrived in washington the moment grant read it he saw that it was entirely inadmissible he submitted it to president johnson the cabinet was hastily called together and the whole negotiation disapproved general grant was ordered to give sherman notice of the disapproval and to direct him to resume hostilities at once lincoln's instructions of the third of march were repeated somewhat tardily it must be confessed to sherman as his rule of action 
all this was a matter of course and even general sherman could not properly and perhaps would not have objected to it but the calm spirit of lincoln was now absent from the councils of the government and it was not in andrew johnson and mr stanton to pass over a mistake like this even in the case of one of the most illustrious captains of the age they ordered grant to proceed at once to sherman's headquarters and to direct operations against the enemy and what was worse than all mr stanton printed in the newspapers of the country the reasons of the government for disapproving the agreement expressed in terms of the sharpest censure of general sherman this publication did not for some weeks come under general sherman's eye general grant arrived at sherman's headquarters on the twenty fourth and made known to him the government's disapproval of his proceedings sherman with prompt obedience announced the fact to johnston demanded the surrender of his immediate command on the appomattox terms pure and simple and gave forty-eight hours notice of the termination of the truce general johnston had already received on the same day from mr davis at charlotte the approval of the confederate government for the convention of the eighteenth mr davis before giving his consent to the agreement required from general breckinridge his secretary of war a report as to the desirability of ratifying the convention this report set forth the desperate condition of affairs the favorable terms proposed the impossibility of negotiations on equal terms he therefore advised mr davis to execute the convention so far as it was in his power and to recommend its acceptance by the states and finally to return to the states and the people the trust which you are no longer able to defend thinking the war at an end johnston had drawn from the treasury agent in his camp the sum of thirty nine thousand dollars in silver which he distributed among his troops each man an officer getting a dollar so far as he was concerned the war was certainly over for he could no longer hold his troops together eight thousand of them left their camps and went home in the week of the truce many of them riding away on the artillery horses and train mules when johnston communicated to mr davis the failure of his negotiations and asked instructions the confederate president suggested that he disband the infantry with instructions to come together at some rendezvous and try to escape with the cavalry and light guns this futile and selfish direction general johnston deliberately and wisely refused to obey he told general breckinridge plainly that this plan contemplated merely the safety of the high civil functionaries and made no provision for the protection of the people and the prevention of bloodshed among the soldiers he counseled the immediate flight of president davis and added commanders believe the troops will not fight again thinking it would be a great crime to prolong the war he therefore assumed the responsibility of making an end of strife and answered sherman's summons by inviting another conference at bennett's house where the two commanders met on the twenty sixth of april and johnston surrendered all the confederate forces in his command which in territory happened to be co-extensive with that of sherman on the same terms granted lee at appomattox by a supplemental agreement schofield allowed the confederates the use of their field transportation to get to their homes and for use on their farms each brigade to retain one-seventh of their arms till they arrived at the capital of their state officers and men to retain their own horses and property general canby was requested to give water transportation to those living beyond the mississippi besides this sherman when he was informed by the confederate commander that his supplies were exhausted gave him two hundred and fifty thousand rations never was a beaten enemy treated so like a friend sherman instantly made the orders necessary for closing up the work in his department and for starting the troops on their march homeward the paroling of the confederate force occupied about a week thirty seven thousand officers and men were paroled in north carolina and these were exclusive of the thousands who deserted their camps during the suspension of hostilities some sixty thousand surrendered as reported by wilson in georgia and florida general johnston closes his account of this transaction with these generous words as creditable to him as to those of whom he writes the united states troops that remained in the southern states on military duty conducted themselves as if they thought that the object of the war had been the restoration of the union they treated the people around them as they would have done those of ohio or new york if stationed among them as their fellow-citizens sherman did not pretend to relish or approve the decision of the government in regard to his diplomacy 
he submitted like a soldier carried out his orders punctually but he said to stanton plainly that the government had made a mistake he wrote on the twenty fifth to grant then present with him at headquarters i now apprehend that the rebel armies will disperse and instead of dealing with six or seven states we will have to deal with numberless bands of desperadoes headed by such men as mosby forrest red jackson and others who know not and care not for danger and its consequences he did not know that forrest had at last got all the fighting he wanted at wilson's hands and that mosby was soon to be a federal office holder sherman was preparing to go to savannah to direct the further operations of wilson's cavalry when on the twenty eighth he received a new york paper containing stanton's bulletin in regard to his convention with johnston this naturally roused him to great wrath he wrote an eloquent and fiery defence of his conduct to grant but hastened on his journey to savannah nevertheless made all needful provision for wilson and then returned to find still further cause of indignation general grant had transferred his headquarters to washington and halleck had been made commander of the armies of the potomac and the james in this capacity filled with new zeal on the occasion of the johnston convention halleck had ordered meade's army disregarding the truce to push forward against johnston and to attack him regardless of sherman's orders these orders though they were nullified by the surrender had injudiciously been published this new insult completed the measure of sherman's anger he broke out into open defiance of the authorities who he thought were persecuting him with deliberate malice and declared in a report to grant that he would have maintained his truce at any cost of life when grant suggested that this was uncalled for and offered him an opportunity to correct the report sherman refused to do so avowing his readiness to obey all future orders of the president and the general but insisting that his record should stand as written he declined to meet halleck in richmond and warned him to keep out of his way and on arriving in washington publicly refused the proffered hand of stanton at the grand review of the armies End of chapter twelve